Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. And good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word. We're going to get back into it. We're going to complete the book of Joel. Joel, um, meaning of course, Yahweh, our Father, is God. There is no other. Now, this book, inasmuch as it was written to uh, and concerning the Lord's Day, in this third chapter, it's going to be a little confusing to some if you don't recognize one thing. How long is the Lord's Day? The Lord's Day is a thousand years long, and it is one day. And you must condition your mind for that. If uh, Drawing from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. So what I want to say, we're going to go to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is to say, Yahweh hath judged. Watch the tense. Yahweh hath judged. And in a sense, you're going to have the story of one day. But again, it's still a thousand years long. And there are two judgments, basically. I don't like to use that terminology, but I will at the risk of... Um, of confusing some. There is a judgment at the beginning of that day in the morning, we will call it, to decipher who it is that takes part in the first resurrection, for actually they will have already done it. And then at the close of that day in the evening or night comes the final judgment. That's the great white throne judgment. This all happens in this chapter in one day. But that day is a thousand years long, plus it'll spill over a little bit just before and just after. So hang on, uh, and if, if you don't understand that, it doesn't matter, put it on the shelf. But that will better help you understand chapter 3 and God's judgment. Uh, chapter 3, the great book of Joel Verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, and it reads, For behold, in those days and in that time, what time? The Lord's day. The days just before, the days after, and that day, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Put for Judah and Israel, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring them back to myself. That is to say, those that cut it, those that don't have a good trip. Verse 2, I will also gather all nations, how many? All nations, and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead or judge with them there for my people, underline it, my people, that's Emmy, and for my heritage, Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. They took it. Didn't pay that much attention. You know, a person really needs to observe what happens in his land. His favorite spot, of course, is Mount Zion. And um, he doesn't necessarily care about it being all divided and everything else. Now, what, what is, where is the Valley of Jehoshaphat? Every scholar, I don't think there's any disagreement if you were to connect it with the Valley Kedron, you would have it, okay? It's the valley between the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion, the east gate of the temple. And I want you to picture something else, though. It's amazing how God gives us information. Just go um, a little bit further down Kedron, and it intersects with another valley, and what is it called? Hinnon. And then if you turn down the valley of Hinnon just a little ways, you come to a very special place. It's called Gehenna, which Christ called hell. So we kind of got a judgment. Some's going one way, the valley of judgment, and some's going down here to the valley of hell. All right, that's, whose choice is that? It's the individual's. Everybody writes their own ticket. Are you a fair person? Are you a balanced person? Uh, do you treat people right? Are you righteous? That means do you do right most of the time? 
then it's important that you do. And that that you can't, you better repent. Because that thousand, uh, the Lord's day, which is a thousand years long, is, it's coming. It's going to happen. Okay? And he's, we could call this the restoration, and you're not going to understand the restoration if you don't take into consideration the thousand years. Okay? Because that's when his people are really restored. Got it? Okay. Verse 3. And they have cast lots for my people, Ami. This is why you had the book of Hosea, was to teach you about God's people. And have given a boy for an harlot. That's to say you sell him for the price of what a harlot's going to charge you. And sold a girl for wine that you could go on a binge that they might drink. In other words, you haven't cared at all about my people. This is to say those that he has allowed down through time to uh, captivate. Or, he says, I'm taking them back. Verse 4. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre, and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? Question. And if you recompense me, now that's not very nice to God. It's not very safe either. Swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. You don't want to mess with God's elect. God doesn't like it, all right? And what he's saying here, there's a recompense coming. The, I, the restoration is going to start taking place. And quite frankly, God is already beginning to restore. I don't know, how are you doing? Are you a part of it or are you getting left behind? Verse 5. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. You have taken things out of the house of God that belong to the house of God and, and uh, uh, precious things is what it really says in the Hebrew. Precious things to the, to the sacraments and you take it off into houses where they don't even worship God. They worship uh, God only knows what. In study, God only knows what. Contrary to God's word. Um, he said, and you call that, it's not a house of God. It's a temple that takes godly things and pretends it's a house of God. I guarantee you, it, it's a temple that won't receive God's blessings if it has God's precious things. Think just a moment real quickly back to Daniel where, where um, Nebuchadnezzar's son drug out all the sacred vessels and threw a drunk. And man, God had a hand show up on the wall and write, and that old boy, uh, just to put it quite frankly, his knees began to shake. He lost control of his kidneys, and he, it was a mess. God don't like people messing around with the real word of God, deceiving his people. Uh, I'm glad that judgment begins at the pulpits. That's what God does. And it's good that he does, because Satan would rather work through a pulpit than he would around one. Verse 6, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem... That's both houses. Have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border? Well, who's the Grecian? Well, uh, where is Greece? Well, it's on up towards Europe. Well, they went over the Caucasus Mountains. They settled Europe and everything. And uh, this Tyre, do you, do you see, if you didn't catch Tyre, and probably I should have said more about it, Zidon is a little fishing town right there on the coast, but a few hundred yards off the coast is a solid rock that is fortified and always has been uh, during its usage. And it was the Kenite stronghold where their ships of Tarshish would come and trade throughout the world, ripping people off. Okay, And God, uh, this is why Satan himself in Ezekiel 28 is called the king of Tyrus. It's Satan's little old pit. Uh, that is to say, place of exchange and he said you 
you've done that to my people, usury and everything else down through the years, and I am fed up. That's what he's saying. Verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. A little twice per emphasis so the wicked can really catch on to it. You know, it, it is a wonderful thing to be a servant of the living God, to know that he takes care of his own. And he takes care of his own by giving them the authority to take forward this word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, instead of some man's junk. Verse 8, And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, that's the people of Sheba, the oath of seven, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. They're going to, the, um, the uh, law of the oath. So there, you know, there is coming a, in that valley of decision and judgment. I want you to know that from the beginning of the Lord's day to the end, there is a time that one could wake up to truth and to the fact that God is in control. This is why the advantage lies with God's own because on the first day, the first hour of the millennium, I will say, still early in the morning on that Lord's day, which is a thousand years long, every knee is going to bow to you because you're at the feet of Christ and that's they're bowing to Christ. Every one of them because they see the majesty of his presence. He will be there. But some will still fall away. But there will be work in the millennium because some never had the opportunity and God, even though they may be Sabaeans, they're still God's children. Who knows? Sometimes um, uh, you have to practice a little discipline to get somebody's attention. Verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. I would much rather translate this, proclaim ye this among the nations. We're supposed to sound the alarm. Sound this and proclaim it among the nations. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. You better get set for it. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Now, um, we uh, listen. I'm going. I, I really am teaching this this time in a way that I know I could confuse some people, but please don't let it confuse you, because there is a war called Armageddon and Haman Gog, which are simultaneous in the 15 minutes before the Lord's day. That's to say, a very short period of time, and then at the very end of the Lord's day, just before the great judgment at Jehoshaphat, Yahweh has judged, is another war among the nations that do not still come along with God. So you've got to give this a twofold meaning here and understand, don't, don't let it get you down. And again, I, I, at the risk of confusing, if it does, put it on the shelf and don't worry about it. Call it Armageddon Haman Gog because that'll be the first. But there is a second just before the great white throne judgment. You'll read of it in Revelation chapter 20. It also is called Gog, okay? But that's, it only means it's the heathen of the world and God himself fights that battle. He will not be telling you to prepare war for that. But in a spiritual sense, uh, we will see him take care of business. Ten, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. You better get set for it, okay? Um, let, me, uh, let me say at the same time, and you might, if you want to make a home assignment and take this a little deeper, make a note of Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now, um, 
God is going to do our battle for us, and you know the proper garments that you're supposed to wear, and you have nothing to fear or worry about. 11, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. It won't do them any good. Okay. And gather yourselves together round about to the cause the mighty ones to come down, cause the mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Um, it really won't matter because you know who's going to fight this battle? Have you ever read Ezekiel 39 verses 1 through 4 and 5? Uh, so don't, don't, don't let things get too tight on you, all right? Just relax and ride along. It's just fantastic the way our Father controls the, uh, the events. Verse 12, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Now here, here, do you know what day this is? You're getting along. This is why you've got to be careful. This is when does God sit and judge everyone? Well, he really does it when he decides who is worthy in the book to take part in the first resurrection. And, but then comes the great white throne judgment where he sits and he will judge every being. We've got plenty of time. Every being. And um, that's why it is called Jehoshaphat. Yahweh hath judged. He's going to. And you know, the, 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 beauty, the beauty of God judging, he knows what you're even thinking, and he has a total record on you, rap sheet. And a lot of them are good, because if you repent, the bad stuff fades away. A word to the wise is sufficient. 13. Put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come and get you down for the press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. That's, that's uh, thrashing. But let, let me ask you something. Uh, what do you put in a press in a vat? Well, you, you put the, the grapes in there. Have you ever seen anybody harvest grapes with a sickle? It won't, it won't fly, friend. Uh, you see, I think it lets us see the, the um, wrath of God as he does place in and that that happens to the wicked, is it not going to be pretty? The separation, the division. And um, the vats are going to overflow. You've, you've read in the great book of Revelation as to how they, they were to put, what, chapter 14, verse 19, put the sickle in, and the, the blood went to the horses' uh, bridles for many furlongs. Um, Quite a judgment, okay? 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision are thrashing. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You want to know how near? It's there. That's when the judgment takes place, and it's a thousand years long. Verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. You got to remember just before the great Lord's day, this happens also. And it's caused by what? Because it lets you know what's happening. The smoke from the pit that Satan as Antichrist comes from. I realize there are many things that we're putting together here in this one chapter. Our Father expects us if we are students of the book of Revelation and of the other prophets, to be able to put this together, and many times one word is a timeline in this. You understand? Part of it, this is what would be confusing to some. Part of it is given in man's time, that's to say just before the Lord's day, 
And then it switches to God's time plan, which one day with him is a thousand years. And uh, let's kind of face it. Once the Lord's day begins, what happens to you? Paul would tell you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, instantly you, in a wink, you're changed into a spiritual body. And so, uh, therefore, uh, when that happens, there's no aging process, and time doesn't mean all that much because we're here forever. That's, that is a long time. Now, we're about to go into the restoration, which would take us even into Revelation chapter 21, when the nations and the earth are rejuvenated. And God is in control totally and completely, and we don't even have the bad ones with us anymore. Praise be to God. Why, why don't we have the bad ones with us anymore? Because God is judged. That's what we're talking about. When God judges, the wicked will be gone. It is so final. And it is such a serious discussion for one to think about. It's a real world, my friend. And you play with your life when you gamble on anything other than the Word of God. Because after this day, after this thousand year period, those that don't make the cut, the judgment, in that valley of decision, because who do you think makes the decision? It isn't God, it's you. You make your own mind up whether you're going to serve God or man or self or the world. If you love this world and its beings, well, you better hang on to it. It's not lasting much longer. Uh, you haven't got much going for you. But if you love the Lord, you will serve him, and you automatically made the decision that gives you eternal life in Jehoshaphat. Yahweh's judgment. It's up to you. A lot of people want to say, well, I, uh, God is uh, he, kind of, sometimes you could consider him kind of cruel. Uh-uh. Don't you ever lay that trip on him. He's made it very clear in here. I'll give you every opportunity. And if you come up to a certain place and you still insist to go your way, you better make a weapon out of everything you can muster because I'm going to annihilate you. I'm wiping you out. And of course, uh, uh, when every knee bows on the first day of judgment, restoration has a good opportunity. What a wonderful time that's going to be in relationship to the severity. Uh, why do I say severity? Final is severe, my friend. Final. Final judgment. Well, why is it severe? Well, if he says you're going to hell, you're gone. That's it. No more. That's very severe. You know, if a person dies in the flesh, they, it's only the flesh that dies. The person doesn't. They return to the Father that gave the soul. But we're talking here, as it is written in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, or is it 11, 28? Oh, well. It might even be verse 23. It says, Fear not he who can destroy. Fear not he who can destroy the um, flesh body, but rather fear he who can destroy or cause your soul to perish. Now, that's what we're talking about right here. Well, I should have known. It is. It's Matthew 10, verse 28. I thought I could have been wrong, but I wasn't. But I, I was four or five years ago. I really was. I, I, I um, made a mistake. I probably, by making a mistake, when the Internet really got hot, I probably should have gotten on it to keep up with what tumblebugs are doing, you know. But I didn't. 
And thank God, I guess that's a blessing. Anyway, I w I'm right again, all right? Matthew 10, 28, listen to it. This is why it's so severe. And fear not them which kill the body, that's your flesh, but are not able to kill the soul. They can't. They can't harm your soul. Can't touch it. Can't reach it. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Better if you're in that valley of decision and you haven't been playing the game pretty square, you better wake up. There's only one way to play the game, and that is God's way. It, Joel, Yahweh is God. He's the final judge. That's it. What should I do? Do it his way. You got nothing to worry about. You know what? He loves you. It is so easy to do things his way, to follow his teachings, his commandments. So very easy. And yet people continue and people do and they're going through that valley of decision. I hope that God's word as it is sown will teach people to absorb that word. Verse 15, the son, did we do 15? What's our next verse? Our next verse is 16. How about that? Uh, the earth was darkened. Why, why does the earth darken in that final point? Because the brightness of Christ's coming makes everything else look dark. 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Out of where? Heaven? Now wake up for me. He's not in heaven at that time. Out of Zion. And utter his voice from Heaven? No, from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel, those that follow him, those that love him. Uh, does, do you understand there is a time element here? Well, what do you mean, brother? I mean, God is back to earth de facto, not just Christ, Yahweh himself. In this 16th verse, that's why you've got to really be sharp in doing this chapter. He is dwelling here. And dwelling here means he is dwelling with man. And Jehoshaphat becomes a true word because Jehoshaphat means Yahweh hath judged past tense. But you don't have to worry about that. That gives you hope and knowledge that God is back with us. He's in his favorite place in Mount Zion. That's where he said he was coming to. It shouldn't be any big surprise to you. Well, where did he say that? Ezekiel 16, he, made an, he married the place. Okay, <clears throat> verse 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. He, who's my holy mountain? Anybody want to lay claim to it for eternity? I, I'd be real careful if I were you. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and not until. And there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Why? Well, because a stranger is someone that is of a different faith or belief, and there ain't going to be none. Why? Well, God's going to get rid of all of them at the great white throne judgment. They're not going to exist any longer. He who can destroy the soul and send it to hell has already done it. So there's nothing but fantastic good people like you that are here. Isn't that wonderful? That's why I said this is a very severe chapter. It should cause one to think to hesitate and to think very long and hard. And I would hope that from that verse, you learn to love your father. 
You know, I cannot imagine. Our Father has all kinds of opportunities. He wants to live with man. When I look at the way some men do on this earth, why in the world? Of course, then of course, naturally, God's going to clean it before he comes and get rid of a bunch of them, and I can understand why. Verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day. Now, brother, what day was that? Come on. In that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all, how many? All the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth in the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Chittim. So, uh, restoration. I mean, you, you've already gotten into the 21st chapter of Revelation here, okay? The rejuvenation of this world. Again, don't strain at it. The Lord's day is a thousand years long, but it is only one day. Verse 19. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Not going to happen anymore. They better be very careful about it today, shedding innocent blood in their land that's trying to help them. God corrects. Well, whose God are you talking about, brother? Joel. There's only one. Yahweh is God. So well, why, why does it say that Egypt's desolate and Edom, that's Rush, Russia, it, 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 the wilderness. There's only one nation at this time. Wake up. Only one nation. And it is ruled by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They don't exist any longer. Only one. And that is our Father's kingdom. He dwells in Jerusalem forever. Verse 20 to complete the book. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. That is always. 21. For I will cleanse their blood. That means I'm going to get rid of all guilt. He pretty well does that because if they haven't repented for it, they won't be with us anyway. It'll be gotten rid of. Got it? And I have, uh, that I have not cleansed for, listen carefully, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Now that's, that's time. Our Heavenly Father does not return to this earth de jure. That means in fact, let's put it that way, until almost the close of the Lord's day, which means almost the close of a thousand year period. And what does he come for? Jehoshaphat, to judge. Do you know what this word dwelleth is in the Hebrew tongue? It is shakan. Shakan. Have you ever heard shakan before? I know you have. Shekinah. Shekinah. The Shekinah glory. It means God dwells there. The book of Ezekiel is closed with it when God says, um, Yahweh Shema. He's there. God dwells. That's what Shekinah glory means. So I hope that you enjoyed that chapter. It covers a pretty good little period of time. Think about it. Pray about it. It is so comforting to know that God himself, de facto, not de facto, de jure. De facto means someone takes something by force. He doesn't have to. De jure means it's rightly his he has the deed and the title to all of it, and he's there, all right? Now, um, what, what a blessing for us when all wickedness is done away with, and no bickering, no confusion. There, there would be no confusion today if people would stick with God's word instead of a bunch of men's trash. But 
I guess people, some people love trash and there's nothing you can do about it. And if they want to go that trip, hey, have a good one. Uh, there is one thing you will never hear me say, everyone must believe as I believe. I, you're the one that must make your own mind up about how you believe. I, I don't want to say I don't care, but in really reality, I don't. I would hope that you would make a good decision I would hate to think that I waste my time teaching all these years. But it still is none of my business what you believe. In other words, I'm not going to try to force anyone to believe the way I believe. And if you want to believe some different way, well, then maybe God has a plan for you going down that road to have a good trip. All right? It's all right with me. But it's so rewarding and so comfortable to see the love of our Father do you understand what he has said in this? I'm coming back to get you. I'm coming back and I'm going to take care of all the wickedness and the pain and the sickness that's in this world and I'm going to fix it up where it is a beautiful place for us to live and I'm going to live there with you. Almighty God wanting to dwell with man. Man, that's heaven on earth because that's where heaven will be. All right, I hope you enjoyed the book. God bless you. You listen a moment, won't you please?